if we will see if it slows things down too much or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's good. Stay vertical. <laughs> um. Okay, dokey. Then let's make one attempt. Uh, can can you still hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds okay. better. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Out of the yellow. Before it was showing like yellow or red or something. Now it seems okay. What What was yellow and red? There was like a yellow and or, or, or red bar at the bottom of your of your screen. Oh, showing like bad connection, but now it's white. So I, th I think, I think white is probably better than red <laughs> or yellow. It's red at the start, then it's yellow, and now it's white. I, I assume oh, okay. Good. Where, where do you see this kind of thing? Uh, it's ne it's next to your name. Oh, interesting. To me, it doesn't show these things. Uh, yeah. Um, why why isn't it informing me about these cool things? Anyways, um. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode, and I am back with Jeffrey Verity Schofield, and I think this is our fourth time on the podcast, so good to have you. Uh, last time we were with NH talking about natural hypertrophy, so we had a roundtable, we were talking about bulking, and yeah, like we're going to be actually covering cutting more so than bulking if we're going to be talking about diet. And yeah, Jeff, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing well. Uh, I'm slowly recovering from the cut. And um, yeah, it was, it was pretty tough, especially the last couple of weeks. Um, probably five to five and a half months of it was pretty easy. But then the last, last two weeks, maybe three weeks was just, was, was pretty rough. Um, <clears throat> how long has it just, been since you cut? last like this seriously oh it's been a while um i mean i started in november and i finished in late may so it was like a six month cut um usually i just do like a two month sort of in and out get ready for the next bulk kind of thing down to maybe 12 percent or so um but this was like a, a giga cut kind of thing where um i got fully lean and um yeah there's a reason why most people don't do that and why I, I don't generally recommend it um because yeah getting to 12 percent at least for me is pretty easy but you know below that gets progressively more more difficult and uh more disruptive for your life as well so yeah for um, sure. i'm glad it's i'm glad i did it i'm glad it's over though as well okay so Sorry, one more second. I'm going to let my cat in <laughs> and staring at me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to open the balcony door because, of course, she's just staring, but it's not going to actually come in if I'm <laughs> just standing there. So um, so, so where did you end up, like weight-wise, or how much, how much um, total? Well, okay, yeah, so like what do you weigh at the moment? Because I've seen your pictures. You're very lean. Well, right now I'm like almost 200, but I got down to like 190, um, oh, wow. which for me is is pretty pretty low because I started at like 225 or 224, somewhere around there. So I lost, you know, 30 pounds or more. Um, and I so I just set a target. I didn't count calories or macros or have a meal plan. I basically just tried to lose two to three kilos a month. Um, at the start, it was probably like, like a, a kilo per week or so, like two pounds a week. Um, but then near the end, as I'm sure you know, once you go below 10% body fat, you can't lose two pounds a week. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll, you know, you're probably losing muscle um, and water weight, not actual fat. Um, so the last, you know, couple months, I was going a lot more slowly. And you know, I kept most of my strength most of the time. Near the end, it dipped a bit. Um, I kept, you know, dieting and eating flexibly the entire time. So I was really happy with how it went. 
except for those last two weeks where sleep was getting disrupted, performance was in the gutter. You know, I was basically, you know, my hips locked up because I, I was getting really bad sleep. And so I was basically limping my way to 16,000, 18,000 steps a day, plus the cardio, plus the training, you know, getting three or four hours of sleep a night. So the last two weeks were, uh, were pretty brutal. And uh, it's true, the, the better you look, the worse you feel, because I felt like shit at the end. But, you know, I'm getting all these comments about, wow, you look amazing, or even accusations of, oh, wow, you're definitely on steroids, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I felt like, felt like garbage, but, um, you know, you, you feel yeah, like hell, you look like Adam, that kind of thing. Yeah, so so I'm curious. Um the the flexible dieting piece or the the not counting calories piece is hold on sir gonna close the balcony door because now it's loud as hell <laughs> my god what what must it be like to have a have an actual kid and not just a cat so um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh so when you when you diet down like this without counting calories. And I mean, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And, you know, obviously I'm sure it's the same for you. Like over the years, I've gotten better at it and like managed to push myself further without counting. But like, usually I, I have, I mean, I say usually the last time I counted calories was now a long time ago, but, but then it was clearly kind of a point where I just didn't trust myself enough anymore. So I, I just didn't want to leave it to chance. So, so you went all the way till the end without counting? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't count. I haven't counted in a while either. Um, I think counting, at least at a certain point in your life, is very, very useful. And yeah. it's very rare to see someone get very lean who has never counted before. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, I guess there's some freaks out there who just, you know, they're 8% body fat year round and they're actually, they actually feel fine. But those people are super, super rare. There just aren't that many of them. Most people, if they're trying to get that lean, yeah, they've tracked, they've counted strictly at some point. A lot of them still do. But, you know, I found that just having good habits and making good choices was more important than counting and tracking. And I know roughly what is in food now. I know what a good portion size is. You know, your body is already counting calories without you writing it down, right? Like writing it down can keep you in track, you know, in line, but you could just eat the right foods in the right amounts. And I think one thing that actually helped was that I chased a little bit of hunger. So if I was a little bit hungry at times, I was like, okay, well, that's a sign that I'm likely not, not necessarily for sure, but I'm likely in a deficit because, you know, if you're, if you've already lost 25 pounds and you're nine or 10% body fat, and you're not hungry, you're probably not in a deficit, right? <laughs> like if you want to be in a deficit, you're going to be hungry. Like no matter what you eat, I don't care yeah. what volume of foods, what macros, what combinations, you're drinking sparkling water, some intermittent fasting, whatever. There's no way to be completely fine and never hungry at all. So I chased a little bit of hunger and you know, I tried to not be super hungry all the time. Although near the end, I kind of was, um, but you know, I just, accepted a little bit of hunger and to me that is a very useful way of thinking about it because most people if they're afraid of hunger you know they get a little bit hungry they think they're losing muscle they get a little bit hungry they they don't like it it's uncomfortable but i kind of like flipped it in my mind where if i was a bit hungry i just viewed that as as making progress so uh, i didn't necessarily track the calories of the macros but i did the things that were needed to get in a deficit so eating the volume foods you know having healthier choices being very very active and then you know chasing a little bit of hunger and that was enough to take me all the way yeah it's it's what i find and um this is so i actually helped quite a few clients kind of transition over from trekking to not trekking. And usually the, the way it progresses is that they, 
I will actually often recommend that they try not tracking first on a cut. Like they will be cutting while counting. And I will kind of recommend them to try not tracking at the end be- because I know it's going to, that that's, that's a very strong selling point. And I, I know that it, it's probably going to work because I, you know, like if someone developed the sort of cutting habits that you, you do develop when you're going through a diet, then it, it's it's very easy to just not track and you're you're gonna be doing mostly the same things anyway. And usually what happens that is quite predictable is that they're gonna even lose fat faster than what they were before because um maybe they were kind of like stuffing themselves a little bit while being within their macro limit before. Now they're gonna stop eating when they are full comfortably. Um and and they're gonna be sticking with lower energy density stuff. So it's gonna work. What 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 is challenging is 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 a more moderate deficit, like kind of like a slow cut, which is what you would need at the end, or maybe you just yeah. want to do a slow cut from the get go. So, so then, do you find the same thing for yourself? Yeah, it's tricky because near the end, you're always going to be hungry anyway. So, like, you don't know how yeah. much hunger to chase, and it's like if you chase the same amount of hunger at ten percent body fat as you had at fifteen percent body fat you might be at maintenance, right? Mm-hmm. And your body is just hungry because you're fucking 10% body fat, right? Yeah. So I, I had to like chase progressively more hunger as the diet went on, which kind of sucked. But if I counted macros, I still would have been hungry, right? Like there's no sure. way, I, th- I don't see a way around it, especially like I have a very big appetite. I was probably eating, I think I was probably eating more volume of food during the cut than when I bulked. Oh yeah. Just sure. because I was eating like lots of tomatoes, lots of vegetables, lots of fruits. Um, I would eat like a kilo or a kilo and a half of tomatoes each night, just like yeah. snacking on them. And, you know, so I, I think at a certain point you have to accept some hunger just because the body's going to fight back. And you have this weird sensation where you've eaten a lot of food but you haven't really given your body what it wants. Yeah. What it actually wants is either carbs or fat. Doesn't even want protein. Doesn't give a fuck. No one craves protein after a hard diet, right? It's <laughs> either carbs or fats. And it's not carbs like fruits and vegetables. It's, I mean, I saw a bag of rice and I started salivating. Mm. A bag of rice in the supermarket, not even a bowl of rice. I just, I glimpsed a bag of rice and I started salivating just because I was, you know, I wanted energy. Right. And so, you know, I think near the end, your body thinks that it's dying essentially. (laughs) And so, you know, it'll do, it'll do weird things. You'll have dreams about food. You'll wake up and you'll be hungry. You get hungry during your workouts, which I had never experienced before. Oh yeah. Um, Usually during the workout, I'm not hungry at all, but yeah, when you're that when you're that dieted down, like your face gets all kinds of weird definition. Mm-hmm. Like I feel my face and it's just like it would just be half gone. It's, it's filled out a little bit, which is which is nice. But yeah, yeah all, all kinds of weird weird changes happen. Yeah, it's um it's interesting because you so so then did you would you say that you overshot a little bit your rate of loss at the end? Um um I didn't accelerate near the end but it was linear basically. The entire diet was linear. And I think probably the best way to do it is like an airplane landing where it's faster when you're further away. So when you're thicker and you're at the start of the diet, you can go pretty fast and your body is actually okay with it. Whereas when you're getting very, very lean, yeah, you kind of have to coast in. Yeah, because it's just like you you mentioned that you were chasing more and more hunger, which is, yeah, like that that's more or less what, like I will either just get into like a food routine and then like I will just kind of eat the same things. And like, uh, even if I don't know like how many calories it was, I didn't track it down even once, even then like, okay, I I know that this works. So I'm just going to be kind of sticking with it and like keep up the step count. Um, But but yeah, like I, I have done that as well. Like, you know what? Like I finished dinner and like maybe so far I was going for like comfortable fullness. Now I'm going to be, maybe at the end, I'm going to be stopping like um, 
slightly hung, hungrier than that, like slightly miserable by the end of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and 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 like what would often happen is that I would, uh, with that mindset, I would also sort of overshoot the weight loss rate, which which is also which is not even purely by accident, I guess, because that's the other thing. Like, so if you're not tracking, then you're looking at results, right? But like, if the results sure. need to slow down as well at the end, then yeah. like, how frequently are you getting the feedback? So, you know what, I'm going to be losing a bit faster just so I can see what's happening, you know? Yeah, I think near the end, I I just wanted to be wanted it to be done, right? Yeah. So like the last two weeks, and this was probably wrong in hindsight but i increased my step count i i you know kind of just went pedal to the metal i started adding in morning walks and stuff i was up to you know 16 18 000 steps a day and yeah i, I think near the end i just wanted to be finished because i'd already been dieting for five and a half months yeah. and i wanted to get back to gaining so i was like all right i just picked a date to be finished june 1st and you know, just went hard the last two weeks, but that was probably exactly the two weeks that I should not have gone that hard. And I don't know if I lost muscle or not, mm. but I certainly, there were times my performance went down the last two weeks for sure. And, you know, you kind of look in the mirror and you're like, Hmm, that chunk of muscle looks smaller than it used to be. Or like, you just look really, really <laughs> flat. I don't yeah. know if it's actually muscle loss, but yeah, I think I actually look better before that last two weeks and i'm still recovering now right like i'm just my sleep is just getting back to normal now and i thought there would be a big rebound in strength when i started adding back in food i mean i'm up 10 pounds over the past two weeks or so so i mm -hmm. thought there would be a big rebound in strength nah because the sleep has still been shit so i think you know the training yeah. is, is still pretty crap as well so i'm just sort of recovering and then you know i'll move into a gaining phase uh, over the next few months but I, I thought it would be like the perma peaking thing where your glycogen is full you're not putting on that much fat you know your training is going really well you know things are really progressing you're adding on mostly muscle and very little fat but it's been like exclusively fat no. and very little muscle so i um, mean yeah i mean it depends on if like if you go into a big surplus then yeah i mean probably you're going to there's also yeah. like um when you really push hard and then your body just dumps a bunch of water and whatnot, and, and maybe you're depleted in other ways as well. And then you're overcompensating maybe, or, or you're also like including maybe some foods that you, you weren't so yeah. far, your digestive For system sure. is not ready to handle all that new stuff. So like it <laughs> can be a bit of a shit show. It's quite yeah, literally it's like, at times. Yeah, no, it's, it's been um, kind of like undoing the last few weeks. And I'm actually okay with it because when you're getting that lean, it's like an unbalanced state, not necessarily unhealthy, although probably not healthy either, but you're kind of like rubber banding from all that, just pushing, yeah. pushing, pushing, you know, huge amounts of activity, training every day, two hours a day, cardio steps, being super focused on this goal. And then it's gone. Right. It's just it's done. It's gone. And like, where do you go from there? Well, you go in the opposite direction because there's nowhere else to go. Right. Like the yeah. goal was to maintain that super lean physique. And when you have that goal and you're in that moment, you're like, yeah, I could add in a few hundred calories and be fine. Like that few hundred calories that I would add in, that would be so great. Like that oh, would take yeah. me so far. Of course, I could maintain it. It would be oh, easy yeah, to maintain yeah. it. I think physiologically, yeah, it's true, right? Like if you go from cutting hard when you're already lean to just maintaining, I think that's doable. But psychologically, that's the hard part. That's yeah. that's the part where I, you know, failed miserably, basically. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I basically failed the previous two cuts as well, where there was a very sharp rebound afterwards. Um, so, you know, in hindsight, it was probably naive to think, that I would be able to maintain that anyway, but it has sort of slowed the rate of gain. So I guess that goal was at least somewhat useful. Yeah. It's, um, and, and did you, did you now find out, you know, or, or was this kind of like the, 
the litmus test that you were hoping for, that like evaluating the effectiveness of your bulk for the last pretty long period. So, oh, I was I was super happy with with how I looked. Yeah, I I definitely made visible progress. Um, so yeah, I was happy with that. Although I think in the future, I mean, I won't get this lean again for at least five years, if ever. Right, like this might have been the leanest I've, I ever get in my life, which. I'm actually completely okay with, um, you know, I've gotten some really weird comments over the past month or two, mm. you know, one comment was like, how do you feel now that you've built a physique you can be proud of? No. Like, what, the, what the fuck is that? Like, I don't know. It's just these, these comments where they, they think that you hated yourself before you built muscle or something. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's just such a weird vibe. Um, and wow. Yeah, it's, it's um, like for me, I'm actually okay being 15% body fat. I'm okay being 20% body fat. I'm okay oh, being 10% body fat. Like that whole range, I'm completely okay with. I was okay with my body before I built muscle when I was a distance runner. It's not like I started lifting out of self-hatred or something, but that's like what some people assume sometimes. Um, yeah. So I probably won't get this lean again for a long time. Um just because it's a pain in the ass the last few weeks. The first five months were super, super easy. I mean, easiest cut I've ever done. Just enjoyable. My strength was going up on a lot of lifts that entire five months, um, like on my RDLs, on my curls. Basically, everything but bench was up significantly over the over that first five months. Um, it's really just that tail end where you know things get really challenging. And you can't be too attached to your performance if you're trying to get that lean, just because it, yeah. it's going to go down. Like it's just, I think if you're natural, especially, you just it's not going to happen. You know, when I see yeah. some enhanced guys hitting PRs the week before their show, where oh, they're yeah. like dieting into a show, but they're gaining weight into the show, and I'm like, what the fuck? That doesn't even my natty brain can't comprehend that. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, for naturals getting that lean, for most people is just it's just not worth it you know um so how much know, total weight did you lose? I cut. sorry What's that? sorry to interrupt just how much total weight did you lose over the months 30 about 35 pounds 35 pounds so that would be what like 16 17 kilos something yeah. like that yeah, yeah yeah about that yeah yeah so that's... pretty good amount yeah and um so then you would would you say that or do you know like can you compare like like for like like last time that you were and I mean, i'm sure you were hitting some benchmarks along the way as well so like how much how much muscle would you say you you added during your bulk uh which bulk well because yeah so i actually can, so i can pull this up here actually um so the like, last time that i got this lean, well, I didn't, I, this lean has never been, but the last time I got pretty lean, I was probably about, I was about 85 kilos. So I probably put on about, but I wasn't quite as lean then. I was leaner this time by maybe 2%, 1% or 2%. So I would say I probably put on five, five kilos, four kilos, maybe six kilos, somewhere in there. And this uh, is in how many past, years? Two years. Two years. Yeah. So probably four to five kilos. Um because it's incredible. That's yeah. So cool. last time I was about 84, 85, somewhere around there. And then this time I was around 87, 88, roughly. So yeah, I would say about four to five kilos, but it, it's hard to say. Um, it's hard to say for sure. I, I definitely grew visibly as well. Like you could, I can look at the pictures and, and, you know, it's, it's pretty apparent that I've made some, you know, gains yeah, in my quads, yeah. in my arms, you know, delts pretty much everywhere. So like this one, for example, I'm looking at your profile. This is, this is 97 yeah, yeah, yeah. ago. So this was like, that I mean, was you look very 2021. lean. 2021. Yeah, I would say 
I, I would say I got leaner this time. And that was probably around 85 kilos, maybe 84, somewhere around there. So yeah, I would say about four to five kilos of muscle over the past two years, um, yeah. which <laughs> sometimes I'll get people being like, that's not that much progress. And I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Talk yeah. to any anyone who's been lifting a while. Yeah. Uh, Sit down. Or we'll come back in two <laughs> years. Let's talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, very happy with how how things have went. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. I mean, I I will say that um, you 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 look crazy, and you know, I mean, I I know that you got some like uh, netty or not netty. Uh, well, not netty accusations, right? Yeah. And I, I will say that, like, I mean, some of your posts, I can understand why, um, which yeah. I mean, take this as a compliment, please. Um, and, you know, so I am not doubting that you are natural. Um, but but I've, I've had some moments where I was like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> how? But yeah. I think I think I know the answer how I think the answer is that, like, for example, this one that I just showed, I mean, you know, this was like two years ago. And I mean, if, if someone is, someone is 102 weeks ago, if someone is looking at this and then they are looking at your pictures now, like um, it, it's basically sure. the same physique. You edit some on your arms, which, I mean, I know that you not just edit that because that wouldn't be like four or five kilos, but right, I, four. yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the, um, that's basically the element and and the delts of your physique which is making people go like whoa because because like it you actually you actually have that like popeye look to you like like the arms are like so overpowering but i mean yeah. it's not like you had small arms here like here you already had like really big arms on some of the pictures where you're flexing it or it looks like whoa you add an inch on top of that and there you go. You have a an unreal looking physique. So it's uh, yeah. I, I think that's the explanation. And I mean, the stats that you're listing here, it's it, it's not like I don't or and probably the others as well don't know naturals with these stats. It's it's just you know where the muscle is is the most prominent. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. It's um, like if you cut off my arms, my physique would be okay, but it would be like it would be wildly different. Um. So it's, yeah. you know, it's, um, and sometimes people are like, man, it looks like you have 20 inch arms. And, you know, when I died it down, my left one was 17, my right one was 17 and a half. So it's, hmm. they were down three quarters of an inch. Um, just cause you lose, you lose. And that's with zero strength loss on curls. Actually I gained strength on curls and a little bit of strength loss on pushdowns. So I don't think I lost very much muscle at all. Um, I might've gained some during that first five months of the cut, but I lost three quarters of an inch on the arm. So that, that's just fat, right? That's just fat and maybe some water around the arm. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it looks way bigger when you're lean. It's just, um, it, it's actually smaller. So when I was bulked up, I would tell people I had, you know, an 18 and you know a quarter inch arm and they'd be like no way it looks way smaller and then now i'm like oh i have a 17 and a half inch arm They're like no way it looks way bigger <laughs> so it really does change things yeah um we actually so i'm i'm also cutting i lost um who well yeah i mean approximately like 10 kilos or so at this point um and it's so it's it's actually quite disappointing. I lost, yeah, like zero point. Uh, well, no, hold on. So at at my biggest during my bulk, and I, I mean I got fucking gigantic and not <laughs> necessarily in a good way. Um, but yeah, so my my arms were like 42, 42 and a half centimeters um, at at my biggest, and now it's actually down at like, uh, what is it like like forty point seven? I think left arm. 40.2 right arm. So it, it means that I had a lot of fat on my arms, probably that I lost. Um, and meantime, waist went down by who, what is it like? Uh, it was like 96 at the biggest. <laughs> and now it's like 89 and a half. Um, so that's quite a big, quite a big drop. 
um, as well. But with the body fat is everywhere. Yeah, like that's one of the things that I notice because there are so many levels to leanness. Like I would be cutting and I'd look at myself and be like, wow, that area is totally shredded. There's no way I have more fats to lose. And then like two weeks later, I'm like, oh, like it can look like that. And then two weeks later, I'm like, oh shit. Like yeah, there's a vein can pop out there as well. And so, you know, sometimes I think people don't realize how high of body fat percentage they are. Like I was probably 22% body fat at the start and I had abs. Like, oh yeah, you know, if I flexed, I had abs, you know, and I had a biceps vein and, you know, I wouldn't look like a fat guy in the street, but I, I was 22% body fat and people hear that. And then they look at me and they're like, Oh, I guess I'm like much higher than 22%. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's kind of a, a wake up call for a lot of people. And I, I, you know, I think this, a lot of the mainstream media has really pushed a narrative with body fat percentage that is totally off. Um, yeah. Like, you know, look at athlete X, look at men's health, all these different publications where they're just way off. You know, you look at a lot of in body scans. I mean, they're laughably wrong. Look at yeah. the, na the Navy method. I mean, I'm pretty sure the Navy method at my leanest would give me negative numbers, right? With like a 17 inch neck, a 30 inch waist at six feet tall. I'm pretty sure it's negative numbers or something, or it's two oh, yeah. body fat or something. Like it's just, it, it's just, you know, useless. And people would be like, yeah, I'm 11% body fat. I'm like, how did you calculate that? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. if you don't look like you're 11% body fat, probably not 11% body fat, right? Like if you look like a picture of someone who's 20%, roughly, you know, probably roughly around that, you know, people store body fat differently, but I mean, not that differently. Yeah. 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 It's, it's also, and, and usually I tell people that like, like, and actually trust me, you don't want to be 11% because imagine like how disappointing it would be if it turned out that like, like what you want to be 10% body fat, but you already are. And it's like, Oh my God, like it's a that that's all there is to it. Like that would be very <laughs> yeah. it's it's the same thing with like strength numbers when I'm like when I catch myself like trying to like like hack the system and like like move weights, which I'm like clearly not ready to move yet. Then I'm like, but man, like be glad. Like how disappointing it would be if you were already moving the whatever, how many plate bench press, like because you're not yet as jacked as you would yeah. want to be. Uh, so, or, well, these days I, I mainly had that with back stuff and arm stuff, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's it, it definitely, I, th I think with body fat estimations, the general kind of lifting public is, is becoming definitely like better educated now than they were sure. a couple of years ago. So like that much, that much good influence Greg Doucette, for example, definitely had, I think. Like, he's he's fairly reasonable with his estimations. Yeah, he's, he's, he's on point. I was going to mention him, actually. Um, most people know I'm not a huge fan of him, but yeah. I don't think I've seen many of his estimations that are that I disagree with. Yeah. So, with women, he's very uh, harsh somehow, like, the with, with the estimations sure. themselves. I mean, he's consistent, relatively speaking, with it, but it always puts it, like, very high based compared to how i would estimate it i could be wrong of course but yeah there have been a few times maybe with women where he estimated them as way higher than i would have um most of the men he seemed decent um although to be fair i haven't watched his videos in a really long time so that's just based off of one video a while ago yeah 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 no he's yeah he with men i think he's he's pretty pretty damn good usually um so all right so then um let's talk a bit about some training stuff um first of all before i forget um so you measured your arms um after the podcast or whenever you have time would you do me a favor like i like to ask these people like can, can you like measure your arms like this like hands on hips and like measure how much it weighs this way um maybe like well, yeah, I guess like middle and especially like down here at like this bottom area, because to me, this is by far the most unimpressive. Yeah. So like, I guess um, one time at just at the middle where you would normally measure it, like widest point, 
And then once I'm like, yeah, closer to the elbow, like, mm, I mean, it's hard to get an exact spot because it's not, not very definable where that would be. Yeah. But I'm curious if, if this, like how much of a difference that this part is making, because I don't know if that can be, huh. I mean, surely it's genetic for, or for one thing, like how long the, the um, muscle belly is, of course, but it's also like I know that you train your forearms, for example, um, like you isolate it as well, right? Like uh, I know you had some videos on it. So I'm yeah, curious. I I that's one of those areas that I need to be more consistent with because it's one of those things where it just gets shoved to the end of the workout. Um, so I'll I'll be designing my new split uh, over this weekend, and I'll have to be sure to include that stuff a little bit more proactively and then actually execute on it because i think forums for me are a little bit of a weakness especially the extensors this you know, this chunk right here mm -hmm. um compared to my upper arms and i i think if i don't isolate them it'll probably get to the point where it looks a little bit weird you know having no forearm or very little forearm and then a big upper arm at a certain point looks a little bit weird so uh, i'll be bringing those up do you know and, what you measure there? Uh, there's a few different ways to measure. If I measure like totally fist straight or arm straight with, with fist, it'll be 13 inches. Right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if I flex to the side, it'll be hmm. uh, probably see. like 14. No. And if I really like <laughs> measure it like this, it'll be like 15 and a half. Like if I really you know, trying to yeah. go all the way around here, it'll be, I don't know, probably 15 and a half, almost 16. So that that's a big forearm. Um, um, yeah. But if so you measure it straight with the arm, with the fist closed. Yeah. So this, this probably, way it would be probably 13 ish inches or so. Um, yeah. Yeah. For actually, for I think forearms, I actually lost size during the cut. Forearms and maybe lats were looking really fucking sad by the end of the cut um uh so do you know what these measurements were earlier like on the on that i don't know like a year or two years ago because um i was horrible at taking measurements over the years um but uh, did you take earlier the forearm uh actually like any kind of body measurement like arm shoulder chest waist whatever well waist maybe not so much but although that's interesting as well Potentially. Um, let's see. My forearms peaked at my right forearms a little bit bigger. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, left handed. My so. right forearm peaked at 13 and 5 eighths. And then recently it's been down to under 13. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is which is not good. But hopefully, yeah, it's an area I have to improve. And then uh Upper arms went from 18 and a quarter and 17 and three quarters down to 17 and a half and 17 flat. Chest went from 48 and a quarter down to 46 and a half. Let's see, neck, Damn. 17 and a half down to 16 and a half. So I lost an inch on my neck. And it's not like my neck was bad before. So. Yeah, that was probably the neck is the one was one of those areas that I think just gets hammered from dieting, and I was still training it, but now it's like I don't know, like probably the lack of sleep and just going yeah. way too hard in the paint. But like yeah. it used to be, definitely bigger. Yeah, right yeah. Now, now it's a little bit narrower than than the yeah. jaw width. Yeah, yeah. Like it used to be definitely bigger, so I'll have to build that back up. Thighs went from 27 inches down to 24 and a half. Ooh, that's how, how, how much is 24 now? Is that like 62 or something? 65? Uh, let me check. 24 and a half times 2.54. Yeah, 62.2 centimeter, which is bigger than they were before, but a lot leaner that's the thing like the thighs store quite a bit of fat and 
Um, I was actually pretty happy with how my legs looked, even at 24 and a half inches, which is yeah. you know, a, a pretty modest measurement. That's why I say that I have room to grow because none of my measurements are that crazy when I was dieted down, right? Like they're, they've definitely improved, yeah. but they're nothing insane, right? Like lots of people are bigger than me. And then uh, let's see, calves went from 17 and a little bit, 17 and a half down to 16 and a half. So, but, but they got quite a bit leaner. So. Yeah. yeah. And then waist went from 33 down to 30. 30. Ooh, damn, that's very narrow waist. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that that's also something to keep in mind, like, because I was just about to say, like, with most of your measurements, it looks like, I mean, I, I think, what was the chest again? That was, that was something really big, I remember. Uh, 48 and a quarter down to 46 and a half. So, I actually kept most of my chest size, I think. Yeah, um, so that, that's, the, that's the really chest big. fat as well. Yeah. The, the, like so that's 118 centimeters that's that's really really big so like i know that i mean i don't even know um i know so, some people that are pretty wide and if someone has like 110 centimeter chest circumference like lean that that's that's really big so so that that one is that one is way bigger than mine, for example. That's always been like relatively narrow, so I'm not the benchmark here. But like, um, yeah. So at my most gigantic fat ass self, now it was like 110 ish, um, and now it's down at like 104 or something, um, which which I'm fairly happy with because it always used to be like 100 to 102. Um, although I'm afraid that by the time I'm proper lean, it will be <laughs> back down there again. But um, yeah, that's the thing. Like. When I was dieting, my previous numbers from my last cut were getting closer and closer and closer. And you think like, oh, I bulked up. I gained so much size. But then you're you're dieting down. And the numbers from before are getting really close. And some of the numbers, I actually, they're actually lower now, this cut, compared to the last cut. But it's because oh. I got leaner. Oh. Right? It's because you have fat on your thighs. And so I'm sure. pretty sure my thighs got bigger. It's just that they got so much leaner that the actual measurement, even with the added muscle, was lower, right? Yeah. Um, and then chest was still bigger, arms were still bigger, but the thighs in particular, like, I mean, my quads got stupidly shredded compared to previous. Just all that walking, six-month diet, I mean, my legs were, I would wake up in the middle of the night and just have veins all the way down like all the way down the hip flexors the quads i had veins in my knees and shit like it was it was i could see my sartorius separation between the adductor and quad and hamstring um, are you gonna do some photo shoot or something um i have a few photos but i didn't do a formal photo shoot i know a lot of people are going to be super disappointed and even pissed off <laughs> that, uh, that I did do a photo shoot. I mean, it's your, your I, buddy, your photos, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I don't, I actually cut in 2019 to take pictures for my book because I was getting into the fitness industry and I'm like, oh, well, you got to be shredded to be in the fitness industry. And so I, you know, plus I was broke. So I was like, okay, well, cutting is cheaper and it'll help me be better in the fitness industry or whatever. Help me yeah. break in. And I kept having to take pictures. So I kept having to like re diet down. So I'd finish oh. the diet and be like, oh God, I got to take a picture of the close group bench press too. Oh. And so I would have to re diet down. And then it was like, I stayed pretty lean for six months, but it was a really shitty six months. I started losing my hair. Like I thought it was the creatine, but I think it was just dieting yeah. too long. And then, um, but this time it was more about just the challenge um, and the, more about the experience um, rather than, you know, taking some pictures or something like that. Um, so I, you know, I do have quite a bit of footage from there, but in terms of like a photo shoot or, and a lot of people were like, bro, you got to do a show. We got to see you on stage. And I'm like, that's a weird thing to want to, 
to see another guy do. Um, and yeah. when I say like, yeah, I'm not really that interested in competing. They're just like, they can't even, they can't even comprehend training without training for a show or something like that. Like for me, I just like the training. I like the process. I get a lot of enjoyment out of it, but I don't have some kind of external motivation like a photo shoot or a show in order to do it. I just, mm, I yeah. do it because I enjoy it. Right. Um, like a lot yeah, of professional yeah. athletes, they train because it's their job. And the minute they retire, they're, <laughs> they're done with that. But for me, I just enjoy it. I just like it. And, um, you know, it brings a lot of enjoyment and fulfillment to my life. And uh, that's the primary reason why I train. Ooh, that sounded very much like a closing word. Do you got to jump off the call? <laughs> no, but seriously, do you need to go like very soon? No, no, no. I'm good. Cool. I mean, I won't be keeping you up for the sake of keeping you up like super, super long, but a few few more things otherwise I would want to ask. So, um, so since you mentioned training and liking training, um, did you, so you, first of all, you mentioned that you're going to design a new split for yourself. Um, is that just to like reignite the, the, the fire or you actually like notice some limitations of your current split? Um, probably a bit of both. I think part of it is that I don't really need any more arms. Like I don't, my arms and my shoulders are probably my strongest muscle groups now. Um, never enough. Have, they've improved quite a bit. So it's like, do I really need two arm and shoulder days a week? <laughs> <laughs> like it's at a certain point, it'll just look kind of, kind of silly. Opportunity cost. Um, yeah. So I think I will be incorporating um, more focus on other areas, uh, namely the lats, because my back actually, got, I think it got worse. I think it's the only area that like visibly got worse over mm. the last month or two. Mm. Um, Interesting. So I have to work around that and improving that, which has been fairly stubborn. Uh, I want to incorporate more ring stuff as well. And then also probably some running. And mm. so, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in a split. And, you know, it just doesn't really make sense for me right now to have two days every six days where I'm working only arms and shoulders. So it'll probably be an upper lower as a base and then other days with rings and then with, with cardio as well. Mm -hmm. And, and um, why did you, cause I know that you experimented with, some pretty high frequency stuff. Um, what what made you move away from it? It'll still be pretty high frequency for back, at least, because I, I think that still has a lot of value. It'll probably be lower frequency for lower body, just because I don't actually find that high frequency for quads or for hamstrings helps in hindsight. I tend to agree. Um, yeah, maybe you can get some quick boost, but like long term, I don't see myself hammering out three lower body days in a week or something, right? Like I just, it's not even that I get sore, I just get banged up, right? Mm. It's just, you know, I'm not super strong, but I do train pretty hard. And even with a good amount of exercise variation, you know, three true lower body days a week is just yeah, too much. And even two, is maybe a bit much. So in fact, even one it. is sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it'll probably be like one and a half. It might be like a five day split or something. Um, like I don't necessarily need to train in a seven day week, so it might be like a four day rotation or a five day rotation. But for me right now, I think training lower body every three days. You know, there were some points in the cut where I'm like, "Damn, it's lower body day again." No. <laughs> <laughs> like, Feel like I just yeah. did this, uh, just because I was walking way, way too much, and you know your recovery does get impacted. So I actually learned a lot about recovery and about fatigue management because normally when I'm bulked up, I mean I'm itching to go, but during the last bit of a cut, man, 
Like you just, I still like training, but it's hard to like training when you just, you know, you start squatting. It's just like, oh, wow, this does not feel good at all. So I just yeah. removed back squats entirely. I just, I stopped back squatting because it just wasn't worth it. Hmm. Even just warming up, like it would take 20 or 30 minutes to warm up. Uh, and then near the end, I couldn't even warm up. Like, you know, when you warm up and you start feeling good. Yeah. I would just never start feeling good. <laughs> like I would just it'd be like 30 minutes. Like what the, I just, I'm, you know, it would still feel like trash. So I think uh, I'll probably reintroduce them at some point. But for now, yeah, they're just not worth doing when I could do another movement that is going to produce just as much muscle growth, but just be done in like a third of the time or less. Yeah. And, and, um, so your, your split now was, so it was a uh, torso, upper body. Well, okay. Torso is upper body. <laughs> so torso, then bro day, then lower body or lower body yeah. bro day or. It yeah. was lower than torso, then bro, then lower than torso, then bro. And I would basically just take a day off when I wanted, which would be like once a month, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. which also gets people riled up. How can you train every day? Well, usually it's fine, but I did find myself taking more days off the last month or so, just because I would, you know, you wake up in the morning and you're like, wow, it's lower body day again. I don't know. Not, like, this is just not going to happen. So I would, you know, push it back a day just to yeah. have at least a decent session. Yeah. And, and, and that's why I, I asked. So like when I said high, high frequency, I, I actually refer to like high frequency, like full body type. So like, like training yeah. most muscle groups frequently. So like, um, I, I find, um, well, definitely found for myself, like once I tried that and I and saw that, okay, at least in principle, it is doable. From then on, I could just never get myself to have like just lower body days. Um, right. So I, I'm I'm curious, like like for example, the lower body. Did it was it just like simpler to set it up this way, or why didn't you include at least like some upper body stuff? Um, or is it because then you would have had to include lower body stuff on other days too? Well, no, it was mostly because it's lower torso, arms, lower torso arms so on that lower day i had just trained arms the day before uh and then i'm training torso the next day so i don't really want to train either of those because they'll get in the way of the real day mm -hmm. um, i guess you could maybe train arms twice in a row um uh, or maybe like bicep tricep abs, some some calves or not some calves it's already on there maybe some abs maybe some forearms some neck something small um like that's yeah. how I perjury style. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's just for me, in between sets of RDLs, I just want to think about the next set of RDLs, right? Sure, like I'm just sure. yeah. there, there's nothing I want to put in there besides one set of thinking about RDLs. So I superset my RDLs with thinking about the next set of RDLs. Same with squats, same with leg press, you know, same with any of these big movements. You know, they are supersetted with themselves, essentially, just thinking about the next set. Because, you know, supersetting bench with pull-ups, I mean, how hard is bench really compared to most lower body stuff? Um, so that's just the way I've set it up. But I, I think it's viable to set it up in other ways. And if someone is, you know, capable of supersetting something with an RDL, like an actual exercise with an RDL and they don't find that it impacts performance negatively, I say go for it. But for me, uh, I get much better quality sets when it's just by itself. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it all depends on how much you rest, right? <laughs> like if you rest long enough, then I guess you can, you can even superset squats uh, if, if you rest long, you know, yeah. Um, no, but like, um, I, I find that like, um, something like, a, um, a bench press, well, maybe not a bench press because of the arch that a lot of people will need to do to keep the shoulders yeah. protected. But, um, I don't know, um, chest press machine, something like that goes fairly well with the audio. Cause like your back is like fully supported yeah. and not the chest is supported. So it's not like your lungs are crushed. So cardiovascularly, it's relatively mild, um, and obviously unrelated muscles, but, but yeah, I, 
I tend to agree. Like when, when I do RDLs, I just like to focus on the RDLs and nothing else. But um, it is a yeah. fairly risky. Well, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, if you're going to get hurt on something in the gym, an RDL is is one of them that could do it. Yeah. So I just like to refocus and, you know, especially with my history of QL, the QL injury, anything that is spinal loading, um, I want to be very focused on my technique and how I'm feeling. So I just don't think it's really worth supersetting. But if someone didn't have that, yeah, I would say it's viable. Yeah. And, and um, so I, I would personally like I, I i don't know i was um you know one thing i i, I realized is that i think we spend way too much time in the lifting community um in general i try to not do that anymore and typically don't but like we spend way too much time thinking about the sequencing of training days like how yeah. so this is a whatever day followed by a whatever day and we don't spend enough time thinking about the sequencing and organization of the exercises within a session. So like I, I typically have these like really ugly, like hybrid training days. So like nothing is a particular day. It's just like what, what exercises fit together. So if I did this yesterday, I'm going to do whatever tomorrow. And it, it's, I, I'm seeing some, splits like out there and like they're beautifully organized in terms of days like it's 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 feels good to just read it like okay i don't know like a lower pull push arms lower like it, it it's so logical for example but then i'm looking at the days themselves and it's like four different chest presses like back to back we're like i don't know chest press overhead press tricep extension incline press it's like do like you're gonna be fried for your triceps by the third exercise <laughs> so yeah I, I i don't know do you how much are you spending on like fiddling with training splits and like trying to organize everything in a very pretty way or how much do you find that it just doesn't matter in the long term if you get used to it i think it matters uh for me right now, I'm not focusing on that at all. I am doing just full body every other day, just basically going in and doing whatever I want, um, mm -hmm. which for the moment is not that much lower body. Like it's full body, but how, how full is it really, right? Uh, it's mostly upper body with like maybe one hinge and one squat pattern, um, maybe. Um, so right now I'm just going and basically doing whatever I want, you know, just still training hard, but reduced volume, maybe two sets for an exercise rather than three or four or five. Mm -hmm. Um, still pretty close to failure or to failure depending on the movement, but it's, it's so weird taking every other day off because I've been <laughs> training every day for the past year and a half, two years or so. Um, so it, it's just it's strange taking a day off that frequently. You only want to take a day off. It's, it's a usual occurrence. So yeah. for it to happen three or four times a week, I can tell my body is, is maybe not detraining, but perhaps like resensitizing the training. Like I'm actually getting sore and I'm actually getting, like I felt the burn the other day when doing adductors. And I hadn't felt the burn pretty much anywhere for months and months because i think when you're cutting like you just become so efficient at clearing out waste products that you just don't feel the burn like i just didn't feel the burn even doing high reps for months and months but i going back to three days a week yeah i definitely become a little bit resensitized to training already even just you know, yeah. and a half two weeks so i think right now i'm just kind of setting myself up for success over the next official formal bulk um rather uh, than pushing really hard right now i'm just sort of being chilling yeah like obviously you're known for your very high volume stuff uh, and and how much do you think this is something that you actually require to grow uh or grow optimally whatever the fastest way possible and how much how much of it is like well 
maybe I'm actually training even too much, but I just like training um, because yeah. that's definitely a thing. I've definitely done that in the past. So how, sure. how about you? It's it's tough to say because I, I did high volume before in 2019, but that was where I was doing high volume, but chasing sets, just chasing the number. Whereas now I'm chasing the quality of the set first and then the volume kind of follows that based on how I feel. And so I think that's an important difference. You know, if you're just chasing a number of sets, and that's how people often do it. Like, oh, how right. many sets should I do for test? Well, how would I, I get that question so many times. I've been asked that literally hundreds of times. How many sets should I do? It's just a random DM on Instagram. And you have to go by feel. You have to either set a baseline and work and adjust, and, or just you know scale up gradually. You have to observe your training and how things are going and how you're progressing and how you feel, and then use that as your baseline. And that's basically what I've done over the past two years, where the volume hasn't been the target, right? It's just been something that happens. Now, how much volume have I needed? I don't know. It's it's hard to exactly say. Uh, I could say that I've I've made good progress with the volume that I've done. Uh, could it have been better with a little bit less volume? That's hard to say. I mean, the results have been pretty good, so it's it's really hard to say that they would have been better with less. Could yeah, they have yeah. been better with more? I, I don't know. Like, it's hard to say where you are on that yeah, curve definitely. because it's impossible to a b test yes. unless i could you know clone myself etc so i don't know it's it's hard to say i know there's a trend of of more advanced lifters reducing their volume but i think a lot of that is because they're getting beaten up they're getting injured and i can totally see that like i you know uh with this hip issue the last two weeks and, and you know i will probably reduce my volume at some point as i get stronger because the stress from getting stronger goes up non-linearly. Like if someone benches 200 kilos, that's more than twice as much stress as someone who benches 100 kilos, mm. right? Like it, it doesn't go up linearly. Like if you look at John Hack deadlifting 900 or something, that's more than twice as much stress as me deadlifting 450, right? So mm. it's something where, as you get stronger, you probably do have to reduce the volume because your capacity and ability to recover, it doesn't really go up with your strength. Like it doesn't go up at all, really. Like the past two years, I've absolutely nailed pretty much every aspect of the process. Sure, maybe there are some things I could tweak, but in terms of sleep, in terms of stress, in terms of making training a priority, in terms of diet, in terms of eating enough food, whereas before I wasn't, you know, all those things, I don't see how I could recover way, way, way better than that. Yeah. Maybe add in some chirotherapy or some shit, <laughs> but, you know, I don't, I don't see how I could really improve my recovery too much more. So as I get stronger, I will have to not reduce the training stress, but keep it the same. And that would be reducing the volume. Yeah, it's um, and 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 just to give people some idea, well, well, first of all, by the way, like this was not like me trying to ask a, a leading question or like trying to make you say that like yeah, I should be doing low volume because lower volume is is great. Um, it's it's ob it, it's never something that anyone can know for sure. Like even those that have been training for like thirty years and they really know their bodies. They can, they can, they will pick up on tendencies with their bodies, basically. Yeah, it's for me, for example, like at this point, I kind of know that for the chest, for instance, like 15 ish sets. Um, once I oh, you have like some kind that of ventilator on or something or AC or no, no, no. sorry, that was me, I was adjusting my AC. <laughs> yeah, no, because I thought of turning it on as well, but I just don't know where the remote is. Um, so <laughs> yeah, maybe it works that way. So, uh, ah, there it is. So I know that like 15 ish sets, like once I start going over that, 
it yeah. um it, it it's not that I start like overtraining or whatever. It's just oh god damn it, I need to turn on that central shit. So uh, I know that I tend to just um get like start plateauing a lot more frequently. Whereas before that, like I, I tend to make like nice steady progress. Um, so I mean, you know, c considering how fast I can make progress at this point, but yeah, it, it's just like one thing that I picked up on, and it's relatively reliable that that's where I start like yeah. setting myself back with recovery. But it it's still um, for most muscle groups, I don't have such hard cutoffs for one thing, and. It, it it's also like it could be that it's not actually 15 but 17 or whatever or maybe it could be 20 yeah. if i recovered better who knows so i think it's um, like yeah it's it's your recovery you doesn't change that much in my opinion like unless someone has a complete wreck in terms of stress and they're sleeping like crap like yeah my recovery has been worse this past month for sure just because i think mostly the sleep i think the sleep is the biggest thing Right. Like yeah. for me, sleep is more important than a surplus or a deficit. If I'm in a surplus, but my sleep is shit, like I'll just gain pure fat. Like I'll just, I, I, my training will not go well. I won't, you know, be doing well in the gym at all. And like if I want to be in a surplus, I'll just gain, I'll just gain fat straight up. Whereas if I'm in a deficit, but my sleep is really good, I'll actually still be able to make progress, even in a significant deficit at the beginning of a cut. So if I'm at like 22% body fat and I'm going down, I can actually still make pretty decent progress, even if I'm in a pretty decent deficit. Not that I'm counting the deficit, but I know I'm in a deficit because the weight is going down, right? But I can still make good progress at the gym. What seemed to really cause a hit to performance was when the deficit impacted the sleep. So it wasn't actually the deficit yeah. impacting the training. It was the deficit impacting the sleep which I'm back to the training. Like I would just be waking up at four in the morning and, and, you know, initially I could go back to bed, but yeah, the last two weeks you're just lying there and you're hungry and, you know, can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it, it's definitely, definitely all of these things are going to impact one another, like kind of dynamically. Um, what, one thing I wanted to ask about training um, and this is something that I'm very interested in and been asking this of various lifters that I follow and, and respect and whatever is how you tend to go about progression these days. So um, I know that like you kind of went through slight, slight shifts in, in how you approach the whole, you know, like what, what are you chasing in the gym? Like, I, I think you had a phase where you were like a bit more like numbers and like strength oriented. Not, not that you were like a strength athlete or whatever, but like you were looking at that metric more. Maybe now you also moved a little bit in that more like um, hypertrophy purist uh, <laughs> approach. Maybe not as much as someone like a natural hypertrophy or basement bodybuilding. Um, so, yeah, how, how do you go about it these days? Like, yeah. So I'm still quite numbers focused, but I don't sacrifice anything to get those numbers. Whereas mm -hmm. before I was numbers focused and I would sacrifice anything and everything to get those numbers. So, you know, I'd be rounding my back more on deadlifts, each rep, you know, hitching the bar up on squats. I would be squatting high or you know, even rounding my back on squats um on bench press i would be bouncing the bar etc you know cutting depth on dumbbell bench press etc you know there, there, you can always do something to lift more weight right yeah. or lift the weight more times always on almost every lift on, if it's a curl if it's an extension anything there's always a way to to get a bigger number it, yeah. it's and it's not hard to do right like it's not hard to bounce the bar on bench press right like it's it's easier. That's why, that's why it helps you get more numbers. So um, before I would be chasing numbers and I would be sacrificing my technique or my volume or my control of the weight, my muscle connection, et cetera. Um, whereas now I know that if I want to grow, 
I'm going to need bigger numbers, right? Especially compared to my peers, my numbers are not impressive, right? They're so, not bad, but yeah. just not freaky. Yeah, like nothing, especially on, on the big lifts. My my thousand pound powerlifting total is not impressing anyone. <laughs> um, I think I'll actually keep my bench at 250 for the rest of my life just to, to mess with people. Just to, <laughs> oh, what's your bench? 250. Oh, for a set of 10? What? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> yeah. Just to see them like kind of do the mental math. Um, yeah. yeah, but I, I do think my numbers will have to improve, will have to increase. Um, and if your numbers are not going up at all, you're just lifting the same weights in a year, I don't see how like a better mind-muscle connection is going to be something that makes you grow, right? Like if you're growing, you'll be getting stronger. Um, assuming, again, you're not like specializing in some lifts, you're not like trying to peak, you're not trying to get like a quick boost in strength from higher frequency training. Um, yeah. Like if, if someone put a gun to my head and was like, you need to squat the most possible weight in a month on a barbell back squat, yeah, I would change how I trade pretty significantly. Um, but that wouldn't help me grow, right? That, that wouldn't be good for quad growth. And so I think as you get more advanced, pure strength training and pure hypertrophy training they do separate quite a bit. Uh, oh, yeah. Whereas if you're a beginner, if you're a beginner, they're kind of the same thing. Like they're really not that different. Um, but yeah, after you know almost a decade, those paths do diverge quite a bit. But every hypertrophy enthusiast I know, they know their numbers. They know their numbers from last week. They know their numbers like the best they've ever done. They know their PRs for reps. It's on different movements than powerlifters. It's in a different rep range. It's with a different technique. It, it's with a different goal, but they all know their numbers. Yeah. Every, I don't know a single guy who is like, just, you know, I just go in and I just do what I want. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I just, I've been training and doing whatever. I don't know anything about what I can lift. And I just got jacked. No, like almost everyone, you know, 99% of the people that I talk to they know their numbers and they know if they want to get bigger, those numbers are going to go up, right? It's just setting things up in a way to make those numbers go up. So for me, my progression is pretty slow, right? Like I'm, because I'm not optimizing to get the biggest numbers, you know, I might put on 10% strength on a lift in a year, mm. but that results in a bigger physique. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and this is why, um, on a, like so i listen to um i mean I, you know just like you I, I consume content from these guys like nh and and basement bodybuilding and you know i agree with 99 percent of what they are saying and even where i disagree it's not that not that like i think they are dead wrong or anything like that it's just i approach things differently in practice and um this is one of those things like the the focus on strength it's it's not that i disagree with them in principle like yes the goal is not to get stronger like or strength standards stupid as like like in theory yes absolutely because we are not here to get strong or whatever and like you're you're focusing in a way on the wrong metrics because that's not your goal whatever like i could make a bunch of arguments for that but um when i hear things like i don't know i you know, who cares if you hit a PR on the bench, you know, focus on hitting the muscle properly. Like just if the technique is pristine and yeah. the form is whatever, then, then it's, then that's good enough, which they are not saying like this, but, sure. but, 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 you know, well, some uh, people have. yeah, like, um, and, 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 and that's like one downside, for example, on like, you know, slowing down the reps and focusing on the 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 stretch and the the contraction and whatever like like too big of an emphasis on the whole mind muscle connection thing is that it 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 actually com i think it compromises performance to oh, a yeah, degree sure. yeah right like it, you're in indu artificially inducing a failure point in a in a set earlier yeah that's why i cheat that's why often on, on arm stuff and on delts 
I use a little bit of momentum because, you know, I did that sort of very, very strict mind muscle connection. Oh, you got to squeeze and contract and flex. Didn't do shit. Right. Like I, I, it doesn't do anything. Like it's just, if you feel like it's doing something, but it's not actually doing very much. Right. Yeah. You feel the sensation, you feel the contraction, you might feel the burn. You'll probably get a pump, but are you going to grow? Right. Like I think for enhanced lifters, that kind of thing is actually pretty effective because you've already turned on muscle protein synthesis. You're just flushing that androgen infused blood into the muscle. (laughs) So yeah, fair enough. Right. Like pump your way to, to, you know, 28 F of my, sure. Why not? Yeah. But if you're natural, I, I just, most natural lifters that I've talked to, they don't emphasize the pump at all. Like if it happens, it happens. Great. But I would never ask a client, like, how was your pump? Like, I don't give a shit. It does not. I mean, maybe yeah. it shows like they ate enough carbs or they were hydrated enough. Maybe they had their creatine or something. Like maybe there's something that is correlated with the pump that could cause growth. But I would say by and large, the pump is not doing very much at all and focusing on it too much. Yeah. That can lead to something where you're not actually progressing. You're not actually using the weights that you should. You're not actually lifting with a reasonable tempo. Like when I see people do slow concentrics, I just want to slap them. I just want to say, well, move it, just move the weight. You're like, you're not actually activating those motor units. If you're like, let me, let me get a No, just, you know, slow down the eccentric a little bit just for safety and, and just, you know, to feel the muscle length. And, but I, I mean, all my concentrics are pretty aggressive and I would say that's the way to go for most people. And that's where if someone has an athletic background, I think it is actually very advantageous because they're, they're used to actually moving quickly and aggressively and explosively. Whereas so someone has been, you know, a desk worker for their whole life and they've been told that they could get injured or something. You know, you can see they're just sort of timid and they're afraid and, you know, they're really thinking about the movement too much, right? They're just analyzing, you know, they're getting out their protractor to try to measure things as they're doing the set. It just doesn't work as well. Yeah, I mean, and and you're just simply like performance in, in general is something that like first of all like you obviously do need some some performance like orientedness if if you're trying to progress with your training because like it, it, that's what getting stronger is basically like you're trying to lift heavier therefore you do lift heavier right so like if you're not trying to actually like complete the set or all the reps in the set but you're like really, really focused on the muscle, then I mean, it's it, it's going to be difficult. But like in, in a general sense, like you need some explosivity, I think like when you're like really, and there's probably like a, like a mental thing as well. Like when you're like really focusing on like, okay, and I'm going to pause. I mean, it, you're basically becoming like so much more cognizant of how it feels that you're also a lot more cognizant of the fatigue. But like, sure. like that, that, that's what, that's what I find with myself that like, um, Honestly, I do this on movements that I really hate. I want to get it done as fast as possible, like the set. <laughs> so it's like, okay, cool, failure, like almost there. I can stop. Yeah. Oh, um, strict, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say um, I would say a third of clients, I urge them to be more explosive, more aggressive. A third of clients are pretty much good. And then a third of clients, I'm like, okay, whoa, control the weight more, you know, use stricter form. You know, maybe a fuller range of motion, et cetera. So I would say moderation is best where you're not moving super timidly, but you're still controlling the weight. You're not like just flailing around or something. Like you do need some control. Technique is still very important. Um, but I think finding that middle ground is, is where I have seen the most success for sure. Yeah. And, and, and so um, do you... I think we talked about this, but like, do you use like kind of linear progression? So like first set is your benchmark or do you use rep goal, like basement bodybuilding or how do you go about it? Typically, I tend to use double progression. Um, Mm -hmm. And I look at the first set is the most important and the most relevant, right? Like, let's say I go 
let's say last week I get I got eight seven six on a movement, mm -hmm. and then this week I get nine seven six. That's fantastic. Like that's good because like, the first set went up. Yeah. If I get eight eight six, that's still pretty good. The second set went up, but it's not quite as good, right? Like maybe I rested a little bit longer, and you know, maybe I was slightly less fatigued, etc. Um, and if I went like eight seven seven the last set went up like i don't know it's just not that important and if i went like seven 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 which i've actually had happen it probably means i wasn't warmed up enough or i bitched out on the first set because um, mm. I've, I've had sets where i i finished the first set and i just knew like i kept a rep in reserve or maybe two yeah and then like i knew i could get the same performance again at least another set, maybe even two sets. Um, so I'll, I'll try to progress on every set. Uh, but if I can't progress in the first set, then yeah, I'll try to progress in the second set. Um, and, you know, if I can progress on, on multiple sets as well, you know, fantastic. That, that's great as well. Like I've had times where I went from eight, seven, six to just like 10, nine, eight or something. And you're just like, wow, okay, well, that went well. But that's usually on more on new movements. Like when you introduce a new movement, you should expect to be able to crush your numbers for a few yeah, weeks yeah. in a row, a few sessions sure. in a row. But I, I typically keep in exercises for a long time. Just because I, I find that I take a long time to learn movements. I don't I don't I don't think I could ever really do well on conjugate. I've dabbled with it. And it mm -hmm. just did not do well for me. Like I, I need movements in my program a long time um, to really milk yeah. them out. Um, so I'll keep movements in often like three months, four months, five months, even um, if they're doing well, if they feel well, if they're still progressing, even like one rep of a session or something like that, mm -hmm. I'll just keep them in because I know they're doing something right. It, it doesn't give me the same feeling as quick progression but i know that it's actual real progress right it's actual muscle growth assuming the technique is still on point and um and everything else is still the same so you know I, i'm happy with very very slow progress um uh, on those movements that i keep in in the long term and and do you have um like I asked this of basement as well recently. Uh, we did a podcast, and um, I'm gonna gonna ask you as well. Curious if you approach it similarly as him. Like, when, what is your kind of cutoff to start strongly, at least taking note of something if it's not moving? So, like, what are you looking for? Like, um, for me, like my most kind of um, proactive is when I'm looking at two sessions in a row of performance not moving at all. Um, do you have something probably, similar or yeah, probably three sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like three, two or three. Um, if I don't progress one session, I don't worry about it. Like I'm not, I don't really even beat myself up, up about it. I used to, but now I realize like, especially if I can identify a reason why, like, Oh, I got fewer nights, fewer hours of sleep last night. And my performance wasn't as good. Like, it's not the program it's it's you know something else whereas but if i can't find a reason for it if i you know if, if there's not something obvious like oh i got in more steps than usual or i, I my pre-workout meal was not quite enough or something like that if i can't find some reason then yeah after two sessions i would definitely take note but if i can identify something for one of those sessions i just will ignore it right so it might be you know three sessions and if one of those sessions I can identify why it didn't go well, you know, then then it's okay. But yeah. Yeah, generally like two to three sessions, roughly. And do you have some like um go to things that, that you like to try as um as a as a first course of action? I mean, obviously it depends on like what you're noticing. Some, you know, um you can depends on how I feel. Sorry? Yeah, it depends on how I feel. So if I if I feel good, I might add in volume. If I feel beaten up, I might just drop the movement. 
right? Like if if I'm doing a movement that is like let's say a uh, Smith machine hack squats, great movement, a bit tough on the knees. So I find yeah. that limiting factor for that is knees. So after probably two or three months, I'll start to feel crunchy and I'll just I'll swap it out. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just you start to feel a little bit achy, a little bit beaten up. And then, you know, a machine hack, a machine squat or a zombie squat or something else might seem more attractive. Um, and then I'll, I'll make that call sometimes mid session. You know, I'll, I'll be warming up and I'll find that I'll be looking forward to the movement a little bit less, like progression. Sometimes progression is still good. It's just beating me up. Right. And in that case, maybe I will change the rep range. Right. Like I find five to 10 beats me up a lot more than 10 to 15. So I might just say, okay, well, let's take 15 or 20 percent of weight off the bar. We're doing we're doing higher reps for the next month or so. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is enough just to keep keep progressing. Um, but some movements I'll just drop. Like, like they're great movements, a lot of stimulus, very productive. But at a certain point, if you keep them in, they'll fuck you up. Like they'll just, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll bite back a lot harder um, than other movements. Like uh, anything axially loaded probably falls in that camp. Um, and then anything that is a, more of a stretch focused movement, I find that just doesn't last as long. Whereas if something is more contraction based, you could maybe keep it in year round. Like a face pull. A face pull never gets stale. Like it doesn't, you know, yeah, it's, it's... it doesn't it doesn't beat you up. It, it actually makes you healthier. Right. So it's, it's not something that would ever really need swapping out. Assuming technique is good. Uh, same thing with a lot of back movements, like most rows, I don't find get particularly stale. Uh, whereas like, you know, a power fly or something, you know, that's really getting a big stretch on the chest. Yeah. That might, might have a, a shorter lifespan just because it, you know, it, it maybe you could just change the angle of the bench or something. Sometimes that's enough, but yeah, often those movements they're very, very productive, but only for so long. Um, you know, something like a preacher curl, I think is good for a nice hit of growth. But you know, for me, after maybe perhaps as little as like three to five weeks, you know, it just doesn't doesn't hit the same, and so I, I tend to swap it out. Right. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, actually just as, um, and then, then we can basically start, start wrapping up. Cause, um, I, I could ask you like a bunch of like nerdy training questions, but like actually on, on, on the theme of prog say that again, please. Yeah. <laughs> if you're great. No, no. Uh, just, just, um, on the theme of, of progression, like since you made these awesome gains, do you know, like, can you give an idea of like how much strength you gained, let's say in the last, I don't know, like, let's say from two years ago or something like those pictures that I showed in 2021. Yeah. Uh, I can actually lifts. check. Uh, my RDLs. Let's see. I did 150 kilos for 12. Uh, a couple months ago and then I actually removed RDLs because I tweaked my right hamstring and uh mm. I was just getting too lean for them. Like they were just hard to recover from. Um uh, and back in 2021, back in 2021 I lost a lot of strength. I was doing I was like starting to run again and stuff. Wow. I was hitting a hundred kilos for eight. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 I had had my own backslide as well with RDLs at one point. That was, yeah, I also went back to like ninety four. But I'm okay with those during the photo shoot diet that I did. But still, <laughs> it was very sad. Yeah, so two plates on the RDL back in twenty twenty one. Um, mm. let's see, what was I hitting for close grip bench? I was hitting. Let's see, it was not good. <laughs> it was I remember it was like all right for close grip bench I was hitting 80 kilos for three <laughs> uh, I have no idea what good numbers are on those um I've never done close grip bench 
Um, well, for okay, for normal grip bench, I was hitting ninety kilos for one. No, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. So I, I've definitely gained strength, and that's why, like, if I gain strength, I gain size. If yeah. I gain size, I gain strength. Like when people are like, it doesn't matter how much you lift. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> yeah. What? It absolutely does. Yeah. Like, uh, and then at the end of my bulk, I was hitting a hundred kilos for 10. Oh. So yeah. So quite a bit better than 90 kilos for one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then for presses, let's see. I was hitting. Yeah. 65 kilos. Oh, yeah. 65 kilos for one. Okay. And then like this past cut, I was hitting 65 kilos for 11. For two. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I gained one rep in two years. No, I, I, hit, it, I hit it for 11. So wow, I hit 70 nice. kilos for nine. So, and I was seated, but like, it was seated, but I think seated is slightly stronger than standing. But I mean, one rep versus 11 reps, that, that's it's not just seated. Big, seated versus big difference. Seated. That's a pretty um, yeah, yeah. O- OHP is such a humbling <laughs> exercise. It's like uh, the 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 guy that you would expect. Like he's like moving. Nothing is under two plates. Even like a bicep curl isn't under two plates. Overhead press, fifty kilos for five. Like <laughs> that, yeah. that's what I see all the time. Yeah. And then for incline curls, I was hitting twenty kilos per hand for four, and then. I was hitting 20 kilos for four sets of 10. Nice, nice. So, and actually, that was, I was actually using reps in reserve there. So I've hit that for 13 before. So, I mean, I've always noticed getting stronger and getting bigger, they're very, very, very correlated. Oh, um, definitely. You know, at least 90% correlated. I don't know the, I haven't run the actual statistics, but like, I've always noticed that they, they go hand in hand and, um, yeah, I think it's, it's good to focus on, but as long as it's not squeezing out the other variables. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pool data, you don't, you don't have, um, let's see. Pull downs. I was hitting 100 kilos for seven, and then now hitting 100 kilos for 12. So not that actually, not that big of a difference. Uh, But I think the technique is a lot better now. Is this like wide grip or? uh, Narrow and neutral. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... That's one area where I've cleaned up my form because I do think that on some movements, you can look back at your old PRs. And if you only have the number, sometimes you don't know exactly what was going on. Like, for example, I've done bent over rows (laughs) with three plates, but they were, uh, they were not, they were not very pristine. Let's put it that way. They were essentially a deadlift with a little bit of arm bend at the top. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, your um yeah, your bent rows were a little bit um like humping the bore esque. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. So like I will never ever bent over row three plates again. Right. Mm. Because That's, the difference yeah. between a strict row and a cheated row is mm. absolutely massive. Like it's yeah. just yeah. I mean, that's that's not even a decade of progress. Like I'll just never get back to that again. Right. Yeah. So if I only had it in my trading log. On paper, I've gotten much, much, much weaker. Right. Yeah. Like often on rows now, I'm using like 90 kilos, 100 kilos. It's just that it's it's with a lot more control, um, actually using the back rather than mostly yeah. hip. So I do think that my pull down form has gotten quite a bit better. Um, you know, it used to be like the sort of like <laughs> this kind of thing. Whereas now it's, you know, a lot more controlled. So on paper, I've gained 
five reps over two years. But if I went back to that form, I mean, like 12 yeah, reps. I could be much stronger. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then on rows, let's see. Let's pick something chest supported. Let's see. I was doing chest supported rows with, let's see, 35 kilos per hand. And then now, like 40 or 45. Wow. Wow. So, yeah. um, That's beast. Yeah, so beast everything beast. has sort of gradually gone up. Uh, do you have chin ups by any chance? Like, or you don't do those? Chin ups, I don't do underhand. I don't have the. Yeah, well, me neither. Actually, I, I've been doing pull downs with the underhand. Mm. But I haven't gotten into pull ups yeah. or chin ups well, with the other. Uh, for me, I I do chin ups either neutral, like oh, yeah. palms facing, or or rotating handled. Yeah, I, I usually do narrow neutral or overhand. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Back in twenty twenty one, I was doing. Let's see. Actually, I wasn't even doing pull-ups at that time. I was only doing pull-downs. Mm. But... Well. Yeah, it looks like about six pull-ups with the overhand or, in a row. Actually, do you just know your best ever currently? Because I actually, I might actually know what yours were <laughs> at, at the time. Because, you know, I, I made that video, so I collected data. Um... For pull-ups? Yeah. Let's see, I hit pull up, you know, 20 whatever. kilos for eight during Tw this cut. 20 for eight? Yeah. Nice. Um, that's actually... At about 90 kilos body weight. Yeah. Right, right, right. So actually, it might. Yeah, actually, I have your data here. <laughs> so at. at... <laughs> Yeah, because you know I was surveying um, lifters. Oh right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so here, chin up five RM. Yours was thirty kilos at the time. Uh, bench five RM was one hundred and five at the time. By the way, um, yeah. yeah, barbell overhead press seventy. Um, yeah, dumbbell yeah. might have been twenty eight. Probably more. Uh, RDL one sixty seven um squat 145 these are five rms right yeah. yeah um so yeah well yeah, it would be interesting to see if chin up like uh, went up i mean how much like to me that's one of the best pulls to like really check progress yeah. on because it's hard to cheat significantly especially with weight hanging off of you because like you cannot even swing back yeah. and forth um yeah but anyways yeah, it, it's so it, it's very clear to see that you have increased quite a lot in your strength. So it's it's once again like if if you're not seeing that, I mean, it's it's highly unlikely that you're getting bigger either. Like acutely, yeah, like, you can justify it sometimes. In the long term, not really. Yeah, for sure, and it's 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 one of those things where it's it adds up to a lot, but week to week it's almost not noticeable you know yeah. it's, it, it's like a rep here and there it's i mean i probably gained about 10 to 20 percent strength over the past two years mm. about 20 percent on some lifts yeah um maybe 10 percent on others um but it adds up over time like week to week sometimes you can barely see it when you really zoom in and I've certainly had comments from people who are like, man, I'm not happy with my progress or I, you know, I've plateaued. And then I look at their training log. And I'm like, you haven't plateaued. You're still adding reps. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not adding reps that fast or I'm not adding reps as fast as I was two weeks ago. So they haven't actually plateaued. <laughs> They're just progressing yeah. more slowly than they were before or more slowly than someone else that they're seeing in the gym. Yeah, same thing with weight and loss, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I just say, hey, well, if you're still making progress, 
don't change it. Don't do something else that might have you make better progress, but also might not. And, you know, if the program is working even a little bit you know, within reason, I, I tend to just, you know, stick with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right, man, I think we can wrap it up here. Um because yeah we're just gonna go on forever and like it's evening time your time and yeah i also gotta do stuff so it was cool to catch up and um congratulations for your cut for one thing good luck with the upcoming gaining phase for two things and otherwise um yeah just please plug mention anything that you would like to um so resources where can we find you what do you have coming up things like that Sure. Um, I will be writing a book on diet, but it's not finished yet or even started yet. Um, uh, I'm actually chewing through your book at the moment. Which, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah do do you like it? So, <laughs> so I, I, I will actually, I will plug you, your product. Oh. Um, people can <laughs> definitely get it. Um, it's very good so far. And um, Thank you. I've been, uh, I think I'm like about halfway through. That's very good so far. And please tear so, it apart on your channel. Like, um, I would be honored if you to tore me down. Like, uh, the the other people. Like, it's it's still a plug. Like, a mention is, is a mention. Book ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been enjoying that. And then, um, you know, people can find me at Jeffrey Verde Schofield on YouTube, and then VerdeFit.com for books. And I think my Instagram is Jeffrey Schofield as well. Oh, and yeah, you have, and you're on, um, there is some new app that I haven't tried yet, but, uh, you, your program can be found there and you like your, oh yeah, yeah. uh, boost camp. So they boost camp, I have two programs there and they have a bunch of other programs from, from people in the industry. Um, and then you can you know, log your progress and stuff on there as well. Cool. All right. So yeah, I might even check that out because, um, I'm always on the hunt for some, cool app that might beat fit notes that I'm, I'm using. Um, but, but that's, I mean, yeah, on that one, you don't have programs and splits or whatever. So it's different. So yeah. Uh, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah. Likewise. Cool. Cool. I'm going to stop the recording. If this shit disappears, oh, my God.